Hello friends! Do you want to elevate your cannabis brand or product? Let's get real, standing out in the cannabis industry isn't a walk in the park. That's where Green Lane Communication comes in. They're not just a cannabis focused PR firm, they're your partners in getting genuine, valuable coverage. From features in major publications, to shout outs in niche blogs and podcasts. Hey, like this one, Cannabinoid Connect. But Green Lane Communication isn't just about making headlines, they're about building your narrative, crafting messages that speak directly to your audience, and creating robust media strategies that hit the mark. Whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned player in the cannabis game, they've got the chops to amplify your presence. As we gear up for conference season and head into Q4, there's no better time to boost your brand's trust and credibility. Ready to make waves in the cannabis world? Reach out to Green Lane Communication. Check out their offerings at greenlanecommunication.com or find the link right in our episode description. Let's elevate your cannabis journey together with Green Lane communication. Three, two, one, lift up. Cannabinoid Connect, the nation's most diverse cannabis related podcast. Here we go. Recording. Ben Bursting, you're you're back again, man. And it's a pleasure as always. How are you? Everything's good. Thank you so much for having me back, Kevin. Um, I feel like we're talking at a really interesting time, right? Like we're right in the middle of earnings for all the big MSOs. Um, things are actually pretty positive. Like they're not perfect. You still have a lot of those price compression dynamics. Um, some of the profitability challenges still impacting the industry. But what we've heard from all the major companies is things are a little bit better on the wholesale side. Um, prices are definitely up at retail. Margins are a little bit better. And a lot of these like footprint exits um, and state um, changes of the footprint like have all kind of been abated to this point. So it's not going to be too much um, change to the playbooks that we've seen for the last year, but definitely like some more positive green shoots starting to come out of the market. Um, So nice to be chatting now. I hope earnings continue to be positive. I think they will. But um, really, we're just we're in a better place today than we were a year ago um so it's very nice like we're still in the down cycle but starting to really exit that trough yeah i mean that that's that's super positive to hear you say that especially as you know we're rounding out or or entering the the close of q4 you know somewhat and getting into the new fiscal year so sounds like what you're saying is signs look like we're out of this downward trend we're kind of moving upward at this point and good things are are to come yeah, exactly. I mean, we see it on LeapLink, like we've recorded three straight months of all-time records for our sales through the platform. And I mean, we cover so much of the wholesale industry. I think it's a really good gauge into how like your smaller cultivators and processors across the country are doing. So to like really see that come through in the data has been a big positive for us. And I mean, we all know that prices have been falling like pretty precipitously um, up until like some of the shortages this summer. So to not really see so much negative price action, especially amongst the harvest um, is positive. So prices will probably go down over the next six months. But for the most part, I would expect us to still remain with like the better margins, um, better structures, um, at least on the cost side for a lot of the companies in the space. So feeling good. <laughs> yeah. Now, those are great, uh, you know, positive market trends that we want. We want to see and we want to hear about coming into the new year. And, you know, t- to add on to that is really just kind of the, the momentum that the industry is seeing overall. Right. I mean, the the Gallup poll that recently came out showing that 70 percent of Americans are in support of legalization or somewhat like, you know, medicinal pro- program. Um, which is incredible, right? I mean, what are what are, I think this has been echoed on the podcast. What are anything that Americans can agree upon at seventy percent, right? Which is kind of uh, incredible to see. Um, but then also, you know, we're now at the tipping point when it comes to legalization state by state. We're at twenty four states, Ohio being the most recent. So, you know, being in your perspective, Ben, um, working at LeafLink, which you know, as you said, has a really, really good handle and scope of the overall B two B wholesale market. What are you seeing in terms of uh, this new state that's come online, Ohio, and and what are your predictions about it moving forward? 
Yeah, I'm so happy we're sitting here um, the week after the vote and you see such strong, positive voter momentum in the state. Like, that's number one. You had it vote passed by more than 12 points. Um, that's one of the strongest legalizations ever. Um, it matches, like, some of the records out of Arizona um, and some of, like, the more heavily blue states. What's so interesting about Ohio is they're a pretty far red state. Um, they voted for Trump more than any of the other swing states. Um, they have like voted to the right on a lot of different like policy issues. And obviously cannabis is pretty bipartisan, but across states for the most part, um, you still have some voting along party lines. Um, what you saw in Ohio is the demographic trends across the state, um, where you lived in the state, all of it was very favorable for cannabis. Um, you had a pretty strong cannabis bent everywhere in the state not just in the cities that's a departure from some of the trends we've seen in other states when they've legalized like when i would compare it to is arizona which legalized back um in 2020 you had a state with like very strong urban demographics and then like a larger rural part of the state you had like the cities in arizona vote for legalization you had the more rural areas vote against what you see in ohio is you have both the cities and the rural areas voting for cannabis that's was unexpected. Like the vote passed by more than anyone really thought it was going to. So I think that has to echo like the big Gallup poll that came out. We're seeing a lot of strong trends. Look, Ohio is going to be a strong market. Um, they do 500 million a year in the medical market today. Um, there's a lot we don't know about the market yet. Like you have legalization and cannabis is officially going to be like decriminalized. So it's not criminal to have it um, starting in one month. But you're still relying on the state legislature to come out with like new policies, implementation, regulations, et cetera. Um, we don't know what the state's going to do at this point. Clearly, we've heard from some speakers in the legislature that they don't want legal <laughs> cannabis. Um, so that's clearly been a big tension, right, where you had voters approve the measure um, and then you have state legislature that may or may not actually pass implementation we don't know yet, so it's really difficult to speculate, but there are some areas that we do know, right? Like the first is you're gonna have the creation of a new regulator in the state in the Division of Cannabis Control. Um, that's gonna be part of the Department of Commerce. That's a big improvement for the way it's regulated today, where you have it across multiple agencies, both agriculture, um, typical food. It just makes it really difficult for a cannabis company in Ohio to like very strictly follow all of the different restrictions and regulations that exist in the market. Um, so that's going to be a big positive. You are going to have a 10% excise tax on recreational products. So that's in addition to any type of sales tax. That's probably going to be a bit of an uplift for the medical market where you're not going to have that same excise tax. So you'll probably still have like a pretty robust medical industry in the state. Um, Ohio borders for other states without adult use in Kentucky, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Not a particularly large out-of-state population, but as we've seen from recent legalization in Maryland and Missouri, it ends up having like a pretty large impact. If you think about licensing in the state, you have around 40 growers, around 40 processors, and then you have around 110 dispensaries today. There's 20 more licenses out, so you're going to have 130 total. Um, what we know from a lot of the other states that have legalized this year, so Maryland and Missouri, there's been very difficult challenges with trying to balance your supply and demand. Like you have a newly launched market, you don't really have the cultivation capacity upstream to match the amount of demand that you're gonna get at your stores. So Ohio and the regulators in the state have done a spectacular job of starting to prepare for that already. Um, 13 of the cultivators have been approved to more than double their total capacity. That hasn't happened in any other um, any other legalization effort that we've at least seen here at LeafLink. Um, so I think that's going to be like pretty strong positive and making sure there's enough raw material um, and brand product availability. You're also going to have like these new stores start to open up. So if you have a network of 130 stores across the state in Ohio that has the seventh largest population, like you're probably going to get over a billion dollars of total retail sales. That definitely depends on how the like how the regulations and implementation end up shaping up. But if I were to guess, it's probably a lot closer to like what Missouri and Maryland did, where you gave comprehensive licenses to the medical supply chain instead of like issuing completely new licenses and creating a new supply chain for the adult use market. So you're probably going to get it pretty quick. 
at least on the leaf blink side um we love ohio we i think we do an amazing job of supporting the market we have more than 30 brands in the state so more than three-fourths of all processors um and all 113 active dispensaries on the site we have more than 85 percent of wholesale volume in the state come through our platform and what we've seen honestly is a pretty challenged medical market where you just had a lot of capacity upstream and not necessarily like the medical population. The number of medical patients in Ohio is around 150,000. That's actually a lot smaller than most other comparable medical programs. So like those $500 million of sales is coming from like a pretty strong medical base, but not a particularly large medical base. So I think it's going to be interesting with legalization and how those consumption trends change. I mean, 75% of people in Ohio are above the age of 21. It's a pretty like older leaning demographic skew. So you'll probably get like some more per consumer sales than you would in some other states. You also don't have like the same tourism um, type effects. So really just a lot that we don't know in the state, but a lot of positives to come. The biggest winner of Ohio legalization is all the public MSOs. Um, they own more than 75% of stores in the state. Um, they're most likely the largest beneficiaries of like the growth in the legal market. That's a bit different from like a Maryland and a Missouri where you had a much more even split between like MSO stores and some of your more independent uh, retailers and retail chains. So it'll be an interesting dynamic to see how like the strong MSO internalization impacts branded sales in the state. So what I mean by that is the MSOs typically sell as much of their own product through their own stores as possible because you make the most margin. What that means is there's not a lot of shelf space available for outside brands that are not one of the large multi-state operators that have these reciprocal type agreements. So if you're one of the large brands in the state that doesn't necessarily have that like vertical presence, it's going to be interesting to see how like the development of your upstream capacity ends up impacting those branded sales. I think you're going to have a robust, particularly large wholesale market, but one where there's definitely a lot of verticalization and internalization in Ohio. Um, so we'll be seeing, but I think most of the benefits are going to go to like the retail side than necessarily fly upstream. That's an interest, uh, interesting situation that you just kind of laid out. You know, the fact that these these large brands that are not vertically integrated, like you said, they're kind of just fighting for shelf space because these MSOs own the majority of dispensaries and shelf space, right? So, I mean, you talked about wholesale as being one option, but like, would e-commerce be another kind of play where they're just available online and not having to rely on the brick and mortar? Yeah, you're right. I mean, you could do delivery. You have to do delivery through the retailer. So it's never that like the brands really be able to list their products out. It's going to be more like the dispensaries controlling that end customer. I think there's definitely going to be large opportunities for brands. What I can tell you already now is there's going to be even more m a in the space in Ohio. Um, almost every single merger in the cannabis space, especially plant touching over the last year, has been driven by this idea of like vertical sales, improving your margin structure and ultimately your financials. Like that has been the main reason that M&A has happened in the plant touching space over the last year. Um, that's going to continue in Ohio. It's already happened, right? A lot of the MSOs that have a footprint in Ohio today have done it by entering over the last year or two. Um, everyone saw that legalization was coming in Ohio at some point. It had a pretty strong limited license setup. So definitely very appealing to a lot of like the large capital allocators in the space. Um, but you definitely do have a dynamic where there's large brands that don't have that same like shelf space that they can offer that some of the other vertical MSOs do. Like you definitely have these reciprocal type agreements in many limited license markets where one operator with vertical footprint will make a deal with another operator with a vertical footprint that they'll like switch the products that they have in each store. So in one store, you'll have a lot of your shelf space being your own product, plus the um, vertical operator that you made that agreement with. And the other operator will be their own product plus your product. So if you're a brand without those stores, really difficult to get in to a lot of the big MSOs. So considering they have like the majority of the footprint, that's probably going to be a dynamic interesting to watch. But look, we see it on our platform. The brands are doing better than ever in Ohio, especially um, both like your vertical and your non-vertical ones. So there's a big pie and a lot for the taking for everyone. Right, right. 
Yeah. And, and one other question I want to follow up on is you touched on the impact of adult use uh, in Ohio as it relates to the the medical program that's in place. Um, is there kind of some some common trends that you're seeing across the board nationwide as it relates to the more states coming online with existing medical programs? And, and what does that look like? So most times when you have a program go from medical to rec, um, you'll have a certain number of medical patients, and then you'll have new legal consumers enter the market. The new legal consumers are going to all go to adult use products and buy from adult use stores. Um, your medical patients will typically continue purchasing uh, medical type products. They're oftentimes cheaper with less excise taxes like you have in Ohio. Um, a lot of times there's like different types of SKUs, so they'll be more focused on like um like creams that you could put on patches um oral suppositories like basically anything you can imagine that has more like medical applications than just like smoking flour um so the medical market across most states once it launches legal sales typically starts to decline as more medical patients just churn from the program like they don't need to renew their medical license because they can just buy recreationally a little more expensive a little bit of a different product selection but it's not really that different for the average consumer so i think you'll get a similar dynamic in ohio where once legal sales do start like that medical market's going to continue to like declining in size while the adult use market grows um but we don't know yet like we don't even know how right. the implementation is going to end up happening in the state so a lot of this um will depend on like what the legislature ends up doing for the program. My guess, again, is that they're just going to license the medical supply chain. That's like the new thing that regulators do to make sure you don't have these large, robust gray market sales. Um, but if Ohio doesn't act quickly and they legalize and don't have a legal way to sell product, like you're going to get this gray market type structure that a lot of states are dealing with today. Missouri and Maryland did an awesome job of learning those lessons and launching the markets really quickly to avoid that. I'm hoping that Ohio will too. Right. Well, on the topic of consumer behavior, let's switch gears and talk about Green Wednesday, which is, uh, I think I've mentioned before we recorded is I'm not super familiar with living in Texas, but um, tell me a little bit about this holiday and what to expect from prior years. Yeah, happy soon to be Thanksgiving, Kevin. Um, Green Wednesday <laughs> is an awesome holiday. It's the day before Thanksgiving. It's the second largest sales day of the entire year behind 420. And Green Wednesday is really for purchasing product that you can use at your Thanksgiving dinner the next day. Like that is the name of the game. So when you think about like Green Wednesday products that are really popular, it's edibles, ingestibles, anything that's like non-inhalable, right? Like the old stereotype is you go out with your cousins um, during Thanksgiving, you smoke a joint, you come back in um, and you have a really great time. But oftentimes you can do it without actually leaving her, without actually <laughs> making any any type of signal that you're even smoking. So I feel like Green Wednesday is a really special holiday because you get all these new and different and innovative type products, right? Like Kiva came out last year with their THC infused gravy. Like that's awesome. Yeah, um, that's and cool. I really like that product innovation. So the holidays are a really interesting time for the industry. Um, you just see a lot of different sales trends. And a lot of that has to do with it just being such a large sales day. Um, when we think about like total sales on a green Wednesday versus the average day, like the week leading up to Thanksgiving, you typically get like two weeks worth of sales, at least at the retail side. So like, think about it this is one of the most important holidays for your business. And it's one that if you get wrong as a brand or a retailer, it's really difficult to recover financially through the end of the year and like really end up being profitable because for one of the highest sell through days, um, screwing up your margins is impossible to really make up. So I think the holidays are really important. And at Leaf Link, like we echo that. We try to provide as many resources as possible for our customers um, and do as much as we can to help them through this period. Yeah. I, I mean, I might be old school, but I, I still go out, I mean, with my cousins or with with my family members and, and smoke that joint, um, given the limitations that I have in the state. But I will say it's really cool. And I didn't think about what you said, and it makes a lot of sense. It's really a time for innovation, right? Because 
all these different formulations of products and how you can uh, consume in various ways outside of inhalation, which is is really cool. And and it really, I mean, it's perfect for Thanksgiving because it, in some cases, of course, with the right strain, the right terpene profile, you can really build up that appetite and uh, and go to town on that turkey. So it's kind of a match. It's a perfect match, isn't is it not? <laughs> oh yeah no we love green wednesday and look i really want to emphasize leaflink focuses a lot on trying to make sure that our customers are really well prepared for all the holidays we came out with our new and innovative holiday sales guide and throughout our guide available on leaflink.com will pop up for you around the website um we give 20 pages worth of tips to retailers and brands to really like optimize for the holidays and best prepare for those largest sales days um and we think it's really important right like these are the days that matter the most for your business in your week around 420 you're doing two and a half weeks of sales um in one week in green wednesday it's two weeks to one week for some of your all the holidays it's just like these are your highest sell through periods so when i think about the holiday period there's really like three big ideas that i think are essential for every retailer and every single brand to get right Number one, it's optimizing your inventory levels. Make sure you have enough product for a holiday. Number two, finding the right product assortment. Make sure you're stocking the products that people really want. And number three, it's like really fine tuning those promotional activities. How do you do the best possible discounting and promotional strategy um, to not only raise like your margin profile and your basket size, but also like making sure you get the most margin dollars out of that sale? And I think those three areas really encompass like where you need to look to plan if you're a brand or a retailer in the space, right? So let's start with optimizing inventory levels. Um, on the brand side, the lead time to getting a product out on the shelf is around six months. So when you think about preparing for like Green Wednesday or any other holiday period, like the planning time really starts like five, six, seven months out. So we don't think about like in April when you're planning for your 420 sales, like really starting to get your green Wednesday type strategies done. But that's what it takes if you want to come out with like custom SKUs and different pro products that are like really focused on that holiday sale period that we see has by far the highest sell through like holiday related products have significantly higher sell throughs during those days than any other. Um, and that's one that we think brands should take advantage of. The second is on the retail side. If you're a retailer, it is essential to make sure you have enough product in stock so the people that walk into your stores can buy what they want. We've done a lot of interviews of our customers at LeafLink. We have more than 9,000 retailers on the platform. We do a lot of work in trying to understand how they think about their businesses. The average dispensary loses 10% of their total sales in a year due to stockouts. Like, hmm. think about that for a second. This is an industry that's doing 30 billion of total retail sales. That means that three billion dollars are lost every year to stockouts. Most of that comes during your holiday periods where like the volume of people walking into your stores and foot traffic is way higher than it typically is. You need way more product than you would typically need. Um, your average basket sizes are larger. The number of units being bought are larger. If you don't have the proper inventory, it's very difficult to be restocked on one of the highest sell through days of the whole year, right? right? So when you think about like a green Wednesday where you have a 15% increase in sales, at least on the wholesale side, um, and significantly larger on the retail side, um, not having the product that you need to sell through um, is devastating and makes it really difficult to succeed. The second area is finding the right product assortment. There's a lot of different preferences that you get along the holidays. Like we talked about for Green Wednesday, you use a lot of edibles, ingestibles, like non inhalables We see on our platform that sales of edibles in the month leading up to Green Wednesday are up 25% versus the rest of the year. Hmm. So retailers recognize this, like they know the products that their customers are looking to buy. So if you're a brand, you need to make sure that you're engineering the correct SKUs and properly allocating your raw materials. So either your bulk or your distillate to going to like the right form factors right. for the holidays, because for 420, it's your flower holiday, like total flower sales are up more than 20% versus the rest of the year for seven, like July 10th oil day, um, the sales of concentrates and vapes are up by 15 to 20%. Um, throughout the summer where you have like a lot of tourist activity, there's a lot of pre-roll sales. Like the summer has a uh, almost 50% increase in total pre-roll sales versus the rest of the year. Um, at the end of the year holidays, 
your best selling products are the ones that have the most to do with like your holiday time, like peppermint. And we saw on our platform that like peppermint um, vapes were one of the largest year over year increase sales for the holidays, probably because it has to do with Christmas. Christmas so yeah. we think it's mm-hmm. really important to like properly um, think through your product allocation and your product assortment. Because when we think about stores, like, a store in Washington where you have no vertical integration has more than 3,000 SKUs sitting in the store. I think, like, if you're going to get the right SKUs for that holiday period, it's going to be, like, a very small number of those thousands of SKUs. So being able to, like, really think through that strategy and purchasing far enough ahead that you're making sure you get the right products for your customers um, is really, really important. And and it's like, I mean, you got to even factor like shelf life too, right? Because like you're timing these, these formulations for the specific time. I mean, there's a lot that goes on the back end in engineering of that planning. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, no, you're right. It's really difficult to run a cannabis company and it's made even more difficult because the data doesn't really exist that connects these like cultivators to what people at retail are purchasing and like that integrated supply chain. I One of the reasons I love where I sit at LeafLink is I think we're really the only ones capable of doing that. I mean, we have more than half of the wholesale market running through our platform. We have a lot of integrations, both upstream and downstream that no one else really has. So when we think about like an opportunity to really understand like how a product goes from first getting grown in the ground all the way to being sold and how that gets tracked back upstream um, is really interesting, really challenging and makes it very difficult to do all of these. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I cut you off on the third, your third point there. (laughs) No, no worries. I I obviously appreciate the (laughs) follow-ups. Last is making sure you fine tune your promotional activity. Like, Everyone's going to use discounts during the holiday periods. Like that's no surprise, but there's a lot to think about in your promotional strategy where it's really important to make sure you're timing and planning properly. So like you have direct messaging to your customers on what you're discounting. You have non-complicated T's and C's where they know what they're buying. You have display and merchandising with consistent branding to your store, the products that you're selling, your technical systems, like your point of sale and e-com like, Dutchie went down last 420 um, and it impacted millions and millions of dollars of sales. Um, If you don't have an alternative to your tangle system that you're using to sell through, especially on these high volume days, um, you're going to lose lots and lots of sales. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's important across all your channels, right? Like we think oftentimes about people walking into a store, but cannabis is an omnichannel business where you can sell it through your e-com sites. You can sell it through a mobile or desktop website. Um, really it's like cannabis can be purchased anywhere now. And when you're thinking through like your promotional strategy for this time, you just have to make sure that you're taking this like omnichannel approach where you're properly allocating like your promotions, attention and time to all of the different ways you can sell product. The last piece of it is you need to consider the customer experience. Like promotions need to focus on driving larger basket sizes and higher margin dollars. Like that is the name of the game. How do you get as many dollars out of the person walking into the store added to your cash as you can? Um, promotions are a really effective way to do it. But if they're not actually adding to your total basket composition or increasing your dollars coming in the door, um, you're just discounting product and losing dollars. So I think it's important to think through those discounts. The last piece on it is we talk a lot about the different consumer types in cannabis, like the people who are buying your product how you're properly targeting them and who you're thinking through. If there's anything that a retailer or brand takes away from this for the holiday period, I want it to be this. More than 90% of sales in the industry are from people who use the product more than once a day. Like your typical stoner is almost the entire market. So when we think about product development um, for the purposes of gaining larger degrees of sales, like, The person that you're targeting is the man or woman who's smoking every single day, um, who's buying many, many SKUs every single time they go to the store, who's buying in much larger quantities with much larger basket sizes than like basically any of the other consumer types, right? Like you've had a lot of companies focus on the quintessential soccer mom, but oftentimes that soccer mom goes into a store and buys one cart 
for six months right. or they buy one pack of edibles for multi- like as long as they can last. Mm-hmm. So those aren't the type of customers who are going to draw your bottom line dollars in your business. It's the person that's using the product every single day. Typically, they're the most price sensitive group as well. So it's like these promotions that let you really capture these very active purchasers. And like that's why I think the holidays are so special. You're going to have higher than ever volume. And it's an opportunity to capitalize on creating new, engaged, loyal customers. And to be able to do it for the people that use the product the most and make up by far the majority of spend in the industry um, is like a really effective way to think about it. So look, I, I've given a lot of like different ideas and tips and everything's listed in our sales guide. But if it's this, it's like, make sure you capitalize on the holiday period and do with the customers that are going to bring the most margin dollars to your bottom line. Yeah. Now, these are great insights. And and one thing, when I hear you talk about that last point at the end, um, where the the typical consumer is that that stoner that you know consumes every day or multiple times per day and buying different form factors it's that it also levels up the quality of the product right because they they know what they're buying they know what they're consuming so it really is a way to just kind of have the whole industry kind of step up and um, get creative by serving, you know, the people that really are the ones who who indulge in the product. So um, this has been great, Ben. I mean, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you on because you're always so filled with so many insights and you're just a super smart guy. So I, I appreciate your time. I uh, I want to ask you, where can people find this uh, LeafLink uh, holiday sales guide that you mentioned? Yeah, if you just go to our website, leaflink.com, it's going to pop up for you right in the middle. You just put in your name and email and it gets sent to your inbox immediately. Um, So highly recommend everyone do it. Again, like there's checklists and checklists and checklists of all the different ideas you need to consider, the different strategies to build out, and a lot of guidance on all of those, including a lot of product insights, like what type of products sell well for the holidays, what have seen the largest increases in certain states, what are the type of brands to really target. Um, so I think for anyone listening, it's going to be worth your time downloading it. It's free. So <laughs> I think it's going to provide a lot of really valuable insights. Um, so yeah, you can get it at our website, but Ken, I just can't thank you enough. Like you are such a rock star for our industry. And I think you have the most interesting conversations of anyone. So I just feel so thankful to be able to chat with you today. I'm like, you're the best really. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you saying that, Ben. And I think you're the best, really, when it comes to data insights and just understanding, you know, market by market, state by state, vertical by vertical, a supply chain. I mean, you know, you're in a very unique position and you're using it for good. And uh, the more we can have you on to share those insights uh, will be good for, for not only me, of course, but for everybody listening. So thank you again. I appreciate your kind words. And uh, until next time, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Bye. Cannabinoid Connect, the nation's most diverse cannabis-related podcast.